Okay, I think we are uh, live here, and I'm just gonna give everybody a second. I'm gonna take this uh, this stream, make sure that I share it, so everybody knows where to join. Uh, let me do that. see here. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's put that tweet up right here. Okay. We are live. I feel like I'm doing a promo skit for Saturday Night Live. Let's draw some attention to it. Maybe move this down here. I apologize to anybody who's just kind of joining in right now and having to bear with me sharing this, but I just want to make sure everybody knows where it is. You'd be surprised. They'll say it's on YouTube. People say, where on YouTube? It's a fair question. <clears throat> okay. So it seems like we've got that up. I'll give everybody a minute or two. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. I see you. Gabriel, Scott, Dan. I got questions. Oh, cool. I got answers. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. First of all, happy New Year's. Happy 2022, everybody. Um, I'm just going to wait another minute or two for everyone to join, but <clears throat> I want this to be productive. So if while we're waiting here for a minute, you have any questions for me that don't pertain to this week's trades, which I'm going to be covering, then um, yeah, please please just fire away right now anything that doesn't pertain to this week specifically lay it on me i'm i'm an open book um and i like to answer anything and everything possible just to be fully transparent you guys know i go hard on the uh the scammers who like to obfuscate and run from things so yeah ask whatever ask your hardest craziest worst worst questions happy new year's eric um and to those who are your, of you who are watching the replay, yeah, you could just, I think we'll, we'll be here just waiting for at least one more minute. So if you want to listen here and maybe catch some of the live questions, that's great. Um, if not, you could, you could jump up um, about a minute or two. Gabriel, talking about books, which one would you recommend? Okay, that's a good question. Um, there's no one specific book that I ever read. I mean, I read my textbooks, obviously, when I was getting my license um, but I, I don't you know those cover a lot of the basics there's no book that I recommend really for learning training you can learn a lot of the basics just through definitions and examples and you know you could find a lot of those <clears throat> on Investopedia I'm sure not just the furus but people who make their uh, books on stocks are gonna hate me so <laughs> try to retweet me because I think a lot of people try to make sure that no one no one hears about me or listens to me uh, but yeah I, I would say don't don't pay for some some book just you could learn a lot on investopedia if there was one book gabriel that i would recommend is if you find that you're struggling um with a little bit of the psychological side whether that's not being able to adhere to your stops or take profits just because you, you kind of get nerves um or you know you, you feel really tense about everything there is a good book named the daily trading coach and that's it's really cool it's more of a compilation of little pieces uh and funny enough, is it's not he's not a really a tra he's a trader as well, but he's a psychologist. So I think that's that's critical, um, that sort of thing. You could read the Daily Trading Coach if you struggle with that. I think he also has a blog page. Uh, can you cover how you enter spreads and what you look for on entry price for contract premiums? Yeah, Jordan, we'll uh, we'll touch on some of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, without a watch, that's just by looking at the thousand memories. Take a look at my scalping video. Uh, I think that would be pretty difficult if you don't organize yourself in asking and the question is can we use unusual whales to day trade a watch list just by looking at the flow you can but just make sure that you're narrowing your focus you don't want too big of a watch list then you're not able to get the information as fluidly as you'd like but it is possible <clears throat> Mikhail Young yeah I've uh, I put some videos up on on premiums on day to expiry you'll see one of the things that I do is a uh, you know and I call people out for for being fakes um, I go into detail about everything. Like I'll break it all down and I'll give you a full video on each and every thing that I'm going to discuss. So I'll go filter by filter and not just say, Hey, this is what you should do. I'll explain it. I mean, uh, I've maybe just got it drilled into me when I was younger, but if you are going to say something 
qualify it. Qualify it. Don't just throw things out there. It's kind of like if someone says the stock's going to go up or down tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to do one or the other, and probably both at some point. Qualify your opinion. And this is why I'm hard on the scammers. They, they run from qualifying. So, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of those. I'll touch on that as well. Um, do you trade with earnings? Notice a lot of furors do them, but always get burned. Yeah, well, because furors don't care. It's your money. It's not theirs, right? And they're going to say, calls if it goes up. <laughs> calls if it goes up. Puts if it goes down. But they just word it properly, and I've touched on that before. So uh, I do trade sometimes on earnings, um, and I actually have it planned to make a video just about that because that is a dangerous time to be trading. Um, but that was a really good question. Uh, tons of investment, but oh, Dan Sage can't uh, touch on that. Go to filters. Hey, Peter, happy new year. You've been successful in your endeavors. Where do you see yourself in five years? Amazing Hazen. Um, uh, I don't know, Amazing Hazen. I, I probably just continue in the path to think of I like where I'm at in life, and you know, hopefully, with a happy, healthy family and um, with far more successful discipline retail traders who are not getting scammed by con artists amazing hazen i see myself looking out and thinking about them too so uh yeah tough uh tough question actually if you actually seen a few tweets saying you are a scammer i am yeah show me those tweets i'd love to i i'll live debate anybody you i will have a live debate with jim kramer actually i've been on his show twice <clears throat> we didn't have a debate just we disagreed on something um, but this was a long time ago. He's invested me a lot. Great. <clears throat> Four or five bullet points you can share steps, create a daily watch list. Um, I'll make a video on how to create a daily watch list with thousand memories. I don't want to give people too little bit of information. <clears throat> Jamie, you know, give me your background and thoughts on how the Fed uh, reverse repo is affecting the market. Uh, it's hard to isolate on just the reverse repo. The Fed's doing a lot of things. I think they always have a plan. They just don't announce it because they want to keep everybody calm. Um, but that's a good idea. Maybe, I mean, it deserves a larger conversation. Maybe I'll do either a Twitter live space or um, make a video on, on my thoughts on what the Feds are doing and how that impacts the market. And actually, Jay Bagnuolo, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that today because I've got four stocks queued up here and there's some deeper stuff. Uh, but I got some questions. Yeah, let me know anybody who... Uh, Want to say I'm a scammer? I will live debate them. Um, I just don't think they want that. They'll just retweet each other. That's that's a game. I mean, I try to teach you guys as much as possible. I'm fully transparent. I invite people to give me the hard questions. I'm not gonna, as long as you're respectful, I'm not spamming weird photos or just cursing. You, you won't get blocked or removed. Um, five stocks call it. Yeah, Zappa 2001, exactly. People naming five stocks with calls and puts on both. I mean, come on, I can't sit there watching for perfect entries. Ten ways. That's Zappa 2001's comments. Yeah, exactly. But that's the name of the game, right? Because they, none of it makes sense. Look, the reality is if you see anybody calling out five stocks every day, scam alert, unfollow. Why? Because it's impossible. That's not how the market works. You don't get this guaranteed quota list where the market's like, oh, here, we're going to make sure there's five setups for you. That's not how it works at all. It means you're not calling out anything with high conviction. You're just throwing things out there and you know you gotta hit your quota. So you're like, uh, a lot of activity on this. I see some of their explanations and we always end up on the fake furs, but it's great because people lose a lot of money on there. I see some of their explanations as lots of volume on this stock, lots of volume on the options. So we're doing calls and puts. Lots of volume? Lots of volume on contracts is your reason for calling something out? What are you kidding me? There's lots of volume on everything. Like, it's just, it's so silly. It's just them saying, well, I know it's going to go one way or another, so I'll call both. Uh, yeah, on Unusual Whales, Dan Sage, great question. Is there any way to exclude um, tickers such as Amazon and Tesla? Yep, use the minus symbol. So write minus Amazon, no space, comma, space, minus Tesla. I can show you that in my setup. I do that as well. Um, and I do that just to filter a variety of things, but sometimes Amazon and Tesla because there's so much volume on them. RS, uh, just a quick question. How do you set your entry trigger? I'm going to have a series of videos on that, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, Yu King Hu, I hope I said your name properly. When you execute a trade or scale out, do you use limit order or market order since the price jumps quick? I don't use market orders. I'll always use a limit order. I, I set mine manually. So I'm in an options matrix. I think you guys have seen that. There's one on Thinkorswim. TradeStation has it, and that's the workbook is the name of it in 
uh, IBKR Interactive Brokers, and I believe on Webull, which I don't use, they have one for stocks, but not for options. They call it the latter. Um, so yeah, how do you control risk on these trades? So you have stop loss at your certain level, the trade goes against your thesis. I trade a little bit differently. So my trade and my risk will be based on my own personal risk and also based on my conviction on the trade. Plus I'm often scaling my trades at different points. But when I'm calling something out, what I'm recommending is that you, you know, at least if you're, uh, the idea is, if you're a newer trader and you're building your account and you're not extremely comfortable with risk and volatility, I think you should have set stop losses. Otherwise things can get away from you pretty quickly. So you lock it in. Uh, and this is a good question that I get a lot. Do you lock it in based on what the ask is at, what market price is at, or what your fill is at? Always what you got filled at. I don't care what the ask, what the bid's at, or what the last market price was at. That has nothing to do with your pocketbook. And we're gonna talk about that. So your stop loss may be somewhere different than someone else. It's The idea is risk mitigation against your capital. <clears throat> you don't care what someone else bought the security for or what their position is. You mitigate risk against your capital so that way you're successful. Alexander Hamilton, method of the strat trading. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's not something that I can, that's effectively used for uh, trading options. And um, I don't see it as a great method for trading period. It doesn't yield enough insight. As you guys can see, I actually have strat numbers on here. The one thing I like it for is it helps me when I'm kind of far away. See, I can't really see these time frames. It just gives me perspective, just like candles. I don't make a big deal about candles. Um, but again, they're all just for visual perspective. So I have like the strat numbers here, but in terms of trading, I mean, you know, saying that it broke yesterday's high or low, something like that, that's, I mean, that's, that doesn't give you a lot of insight. And I could show you a million examples where it doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, I'm gonna just run through these questions and then we're gonna get into the breakdowns. So I will stop at Kurtej, Kurtej, Jill, sorry about that, Kurtej. And I'm gonna move down from starting at Curtis. Yeah, the whole column, put things all over Twitter. Haven't seen a trader yet who doesn't do that. Yeah, Curtis Conrad, because their business, like when you're a fake furu on Twitter, it's your business. They don't do this for fun. They're not here because they were successful elsewhere in life and they just enjoy this and this is something they've lived their life behind. They're here to make money and they don't understand the market very well. So the only way to make sure that they're frequently right on trades is to play both sides. Like I say, like if you just say this is going to be the open and say, I've got a call up here and a put down here. Well, if you just know the basic range of a stock, you know it's going to break through one of them and you'll be like, oh, we crushed it, right? I hope everybody gets that, how dumb and how easy it is. That is the business that they're in. Then it's going to be $2,000 for my uh, room. Like, you know, uh, and to speak to that, Chris Conrad, who are these people? Why don't you show your identity? Why is it always a picture of, you know, an avatar that isn't you? How come you never come forward? I, I kept my identity a little bit <clears throat> under wraps just because I was in a lot of their chat rooms and I was trying to just finish out and ask the questions I needed to ask and play dumb. Uh, and then once I was done, I told everybody, I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I can always go sign up with a different account and they won't know who I am. But that's, that's the whole game. It's a business. That's why they do the calls and puts thing. They need to be right every day. Just like they pick five stocks every single day, no matter what the market conditions are, no matter how bad the data and how volatile it is, because they have a quota they need to deliver to get people going, bro, you're awesome. Oh my God, the greatest. Thanks for guessing that a stock will either go up or down. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I drank some green tea earlier. Just killing me. Uh, are you daily trading options or also swinging them? I do swing sometimes. I do day trading far more frequently. And I also hold underlying, um, but I manage private equity. So there's a difference. What are your studies on TOS? I could do that in a video. And I said I'd stop at Gertage. Um I'm going to move through these quickly. Easiest way to grow an account with, yeah, around 3K. Um, discipline trading, you know. Discipline trading, and this is in response to Mason Mays. What is the easiest way to grow an account with around 3K? So. I, the word easiest, I don't want anybody to conflate that with easy, right? There's easier ways. There's no easy way to do something properly. Um, lots of discipline, Mason Mays, and don't YOLO your positions, right? Because it gets harder and harder to climb back up the ladder if you're going really heavy in. Like if you're going all 3K on every trade, you take one or two losses, and now to get back to that position, it's going to take you longer. So discipline, proper sizing, 
and just stick to it and know that the averages will work with you. <coughs> Jeez, if I clear my throat again. Uh, let's see. Touch on skin. Make a video about out of the money calls that don't expire for two to six months. Yeah, I do touch on that, Andrew Rosen, in my DTE video. So take a look at that. If then, and if that's not enough, please circle back to me and let me know what you're thinking and maybe I can expand on that. Active Trader on TOS is just the best out there. Yeah, yeah, but their fills aren't the best. <laughs> can you uh, talk about how you used unusual whales to find yesterday's plays? Yes, Gortesh. Okay, uh, and I will come back to these questions. Let's let's get cracking because I know a lot of people. Um, oh, ah, I'm tempted to touch on something there, but okay, stop the Gortesh. I will get back to a lot of this. So let's take a look here and let's start breaking down some of the anatomy of. AMD yesterday, and AMD ran for 277%. Does that mean you were expected to get 277% return on AMD? No, we take profits, right? Like when I post, I, I think I might be the only person who says this. I remind everybody, I'm posting so that you understand the magnitude of the move, right? So that you can have high conviction. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you were expected to get the peak entry and the peak exit. That is crazy furu talk it's nonsense and i think that hurts traders i say this over and over again if you got into stocks and you spent time on twitter and you started looking around it would warp your thought pattern in a way that is extremely detrimental because you would start thinking oh man everybody's getting these 200 percent plays and 160 percent and 48 percent or you know 148 percent and you start looking at like a 30 40 50 percent return is not being good that is absolute nonsense, and I'm just touching on that before I even go on. And I know this is counter marketing because, you know, we, we see these great things that I tweet out, but it's, it's I don't care about the marketing. I care about being honest and, you know, developing good traders. Like, right? I'm sharing what I did. So if I don't share good practices, that means I suck, right? And I take that hard, and that's my personal credibility. So you're not expected to get the peak or anywhere near that. Don't listen to the nut jobs who are saying that you should. They don't know what they're talking about. They, they get their fake names. They have zero back now, background in finance. I promise you 99.9% .9 of them. I saw one person saying, I know stocks. I was a, I was a teller at a bank. I, the, like, it was a weird way of conflating things, but I guess he got people to be like, oh, he worked for Bank of America. He must know stocks. No. Okay. Um, so you're not expected to get those max returns and 30, 40, 50% is amazing. Think of what you get from your bank. What kind of interest you get on your bank account? You get, it's, it's peanuts. So then people turn because of the way Twitter warps their mentality and they scoff at 40%. It's wild. Okay. So let's get into this one. So AMD, I had puts on AMD at 147. Okay. Uh, I expected AMD might climb early. I think there were going to be some buyers potentially building positions for, 2022 because they they've opened up they've already seen a bit of the sell-off uh <clears throat> had a lot of data supporting that we might see a bit of a pullback so let me first bring up i think it's here or here no it's going to be in the last one of course amd this is what we saw for amd coming from unusual whales right and just take a look at this so this obviously comes down to the way that i filter and, and i i explain and i teach a lot about this but the way that I filtered it down, I was able to narrow my focus. And if you, you know, you're trying to understand that better, watch my premiums filter video. Narrowed my focus and look at what we're seeing here. 157's pretty darn close to the money. That's a lot of exposure. Expiry date. New Year's Day, that's yesterday. And look at the premiums coming in on this. These are some heavy, heavy bets. This is a heavy bullish, uh, sorry, bearish flow. So I had that feeling. I know that they were working with different underlyings, but of course I set my own prices a little bit differently. I saw 147. That's a combination of a bunch of different factors, but one of those factors was also understanding that we were probably going to have a run-up. So everybody was saying, if you watch the fake furus, they probably had calls, you know, somewhere around here, or maybe got lucky on this quick run-up, and then their puts are going to be down here, <clears throat> right? And that's where you lose a lot of money because We've already made our money by down here. I kept it steady and said, I'm not moving my put target because like I always say, I'm convicted in what I say. If I say it and I believe it, if I say it, I do believe it, I will often just leave it. And so yeah, we're above where things, uh, where the open is. That's okay, I'm confident. And I know that having it higher is gonna give us a lot more downside, which is upside to us because it's a put, right? 
So here we have a quick break upwards. Would you have taken it here? No, of course not. This is this is way too much upside momentum. Look at the move that we're making. And there's no pullback. So you don't have anything. When I talk about this, I always explain when I have it set above, and that's my trigger above open, what I'm looking for is a move up and then to break back down. So now where could you have entered this trade? All right. And this is where it gets interesting. So I put out a tweet saying, you know, don't catch a falling knife and look for consolidation, right? That means like I see too quick of a move here. I want to let it settle down because you might have a pretty high IV. You see a spike in the IV, particularly as we get down here. Now, could you have taken it anywhere in here and perhaps gotten stopped out? It's possible. Yeah, absolutely. You could take it here. Um, and this might constitute 10% just because we're on a Friday. So it's very possible that you're stopped out here. Now, would I have taken it here? No, because I think it's too early. Could you have taken it here and maybe gotten stopped out here? Yeah, um, particularly as I was also talking about moving your stops up to break even, right? Like once we started to pull ahead, I think that was around you know, maybe 9.59, which was here, you're in the clear. But just to make the point, you know, depending on how quickly you entered, this would have been a little bit too early for me, as I noted, and I, I'm trying to make live tweets, but I'm sure you guys understand it's a little bit difficult I'm managing my own capital my own equity firm and trying to also communicate with everybody live as a trade is happening so I've got one monitor open I'm chatting with everybody I got another monitor that I'm looking at I actually don't even look at what I'm writing until it's done I just do a quick look over because I'm trying to keep my eyes focused on the screen so you very well could have gotten in here particularly because it's zero days to expiry the option contract price is low so you know if you're in it, I think around, it was in the 70 cent area, seven cent pullback is, will stop you at 10%. But if you're moving your stops up to zero and you're slightly ahead, remember this is your stops at zero. So as you pull down, if you're here, you can't get stopped. What do I do in those cases where it's kind of choppy action, not really sure where to get in? Well, I'm looking for it to consolidate. Does that mean there's a specific number of minutes that I look for it to consolidate at? No, but notice it's consolidating right at our line. And this is why I say like, I have high conviction plays. I'm not just guessing like Furus. It's turned out to be a very critical line. Uh, what Here's a few things you can do, right? Because there's a few. If you get in early and you get stopped out, that's okay. You can re-enter. Like I said, this is a little too early. If you get in here and you move your stops up to zero and you hit break even, that's okay. I size in when I'm not 100% certain or I size in just to be, to be cautious because I really want to capture a move. So let's say I got in, let's say I jumped the gun. And I got in here, right? And I got stopped out here. Very possible. But like I said, you shouldn't be getting in as we're spiking down. Don't catch falling knife. I wouldn't go in full size. I'll usually scale in. And okay, I give myself room to re-enter the trade. I get into the trade. I start seeing a nice breakdown. And this is what I like here. It's like, now, notice something. We're kind of getting a little bit more consolidation. There's been downward pressure. We've been here. You can see that we open here. This is where we peak up. You're not getting stopped out at all. And then you see a breakdown and it's all green, right? And here is where I was telling everybody, hey, you're about 50% ahead. Make sure you move your stops up. You take profits. Take some profits today. If you just moved up to break even, then you would have ridden this all the way down to 277%. That's if you, you know, held all day. I don't think you should have because there was a lot of pullbacks. But I think this was a great place to take some profits, not only because of where we're at, because the speed of the move down would have juiced up the IV and give us an opportunity to take more profits. I think it was 50% plus. You get a pullback here, I think you should be taking size and position off, right? At the very least, like I always, pra I always practice and preach, take a little bit off of your position. Let's say I have 20 contracts, you know, like I'm in and out, 20 contracts, I'm taking maybe 10 off um, to take some profits as we start to pull back. I see this pullback, might take another 10 and just hold 10, I see a move. We continue that move, probably be less comfortable here. Again, because it's a Friday too, so you got to keep in mind um, we're working against theta. So theta is going to be er eroding your premium, plus we're getting this uh, bigger move to the downside. Let me zoom out so you could see if you're in here and you wrote it all the way down here, I completely understand that with some of your size. This is a big pullback. Most people should be out and anything you're leaving on should be minimal. You're ahead but I don't want to risk too much profit. Like you've already booked quite a bit in my opinion if you're holding anything. And then where you wrote it out to really depends on you. I like to get out after big moves. I would have seen this as like a great cue close to the end of the day. Take some profits. 
So that was the anatomy of AMD. I saw a lot of people who did extremely well, obviously, like this was our entry region. But again, like there's, there's opportunity for us to pull back here and you can move out. Um, as I always say, one of the advantages of not going completely YOLO is that you, you, you have buying capital to re-enter a trade. And that's the other thing just gonna slam and smash the furos. They don't get it when they post this. When they're telling you calls and puts and they're telling you go in on this trade, it erodes your buying capital. So if you're always going in and out because it went up and then it went down, it's harder for you to build positions. I'm saying that on a convicted position, you could do that. So uh, let me take a quick look at questions because I promised this would be a, a good Q&A session. Uh, we'll start with DSSA. And notice a lot of orders come out when the dividend payout dates are approaching for a company maybe at least two weeks out. Does that seem like a good idea to you? Uh, no. Not as much because the conviction of, of their purchase uh, is for that, is for the dividend, right? And um, it can be a mixed bag, right? Because you'll see a bullish flow. Like some people like to hedge on that. Dividends are similar to earnings. They're not as volatile. volatile. But let me explain the detail because, again, I don't like to just give blanket answers. I want you guys to understand how I think so you understand it. So we have a dividend date. You're going to get a lot. You're going to get a bullish flow. You might see a bearish flow. Here are the reasons. Because you're going to get a lot of people purchasing before the dividend date because they're trying to move in on that on that date and play the upside of it. And, you know, they reap the benefits of the dividend. But then you're going to get a lot of people selling and taking profits who, particularly if you're looking to close your position, that's a great day to do that. So there's buying and selling pressure. So I believe that when I see a lot of the flow, it tends to be it tends to be people who are just being a little bit more speculative i don't like pure speculation i like to have as high conviction as possible right so I'll let them speculate i understand what they're speculating on uh, i'd rather not be involved because the dividend is going to be static anyhow you're not going to say hey we're going to issue a 47 cent dividend here's five dollars it's not going to work that way that's what you're learning on earnings where there's there's far more volatility uh, DSS saying, I hope that answered your question in depth. Uh, good touch kill. How do you build your daily watch list? Yeah, I'm going to make full videos on that. There's a lot of ways that I do that. Um, let's see. Nick Manning, what triggers you to a stock that you then go to, to, to confirm a play? That kind of ties into good question. So when I'm building my list, there's a lot of things that I look at. Uh, I'll just touch on them for you guys to give you an idea so you'll know why it's worthy of a full video. First off, I have the live flow open the entire day on separate monitors, right? I'm not hyper-focused on it because I'm managing my trades and watching the market, but I'm looking over. And if anything catches my eye on the live flow, I note it down for later on because I'll just I'll come back and review it. I spend a couple hours doing reviews and analysis each night. I'll just come back to it. That's one way. Two. I will also look for major news. I will circle back and analyze anything where there was major news, and that'll go into my watch list. Um, I'll also do a scan to look at things that broke their average true range. So if there was more volatility on the underlying, like if, let's say, AMD shot up nine points and shot down seven points, I'm going to be looking into AMD, right? Because particularly if I wasn't on that day anyhow, I'm going to be saying, what did I not know? What happened? How can I better improve my view here? And what do I see for tomorrow? So I'm looking to see which stocks made moves. I'm looking at major news. I'm looking to see what pops up on my uh, live flow during the day. Uh, but I would have to, I think, to do it justice and to provide you guys with the most help, I would have to break that down in a full video so you could maybe just be more comfortable get a visual. Sunny asks, general market forecast for 2022. Do you see a crash coming? Um, I see a pullback coming, but that's, you know, I don't want to be like fake furu talk here. If I can't qualify it and give you specificity, then what's that worth, right? Uh, of course, there's going to be a pullback at some point. If you just look at the history of the stock markets, there will be. Are there preconditions for a pullback? Yeah. Uh, are the Fed's going to begin tapering? Yes. Uh, but they usually bake that in a little bit earlier. Do I have other concerns? Yeah. I mean, inflationary pressures, economic issues, um, hyperinflation on a lot of different things. There certainly is a, a recipe for it. Um, what actually happens, we'll see. I mean, there are ways that the Fed can defer it. And I think that every administration likes to defer a crash as much as possible so that they could blame the next one, right? Um, we'll see what they do. 
I got questions. Yep, I noticed a lot of fools played the same stocks over and over again, suddenly became millionaires or 18, at 18 or 19. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're all, they're all trillionaires. Like the one who said if you invested uh, $200 with them, you would have made 70000 last week. Yeah, okay. Because if you're turning over that kind of return, you're still on Twitter trying to get $3.95 to enter your Discord. Oh, actually, it's, they, they take people for like 3000 And guys, I'm, I always want to be clear on this. I've paid a lot of money for good education, and it's a value, and I'm happy. I provide, or, you know, I have provided, I work professionally. I got paid to consult people, right? I wasn't a fake for I was a licensed trader. That's fine. And I've worked with private clients. Also fine. If you're getting something of value, go for it. Like if you are getting your health evaluated and you pay a doctor to evaluate your health, great. I love that, right? That's like a licensed trader or somebody who like a CFA is going to help you understand your portfolio. Someone who knows what they're talking about. Pay that. That's great. I'm all for free capital markets and people exchanging goods for things, exchanging um, their money for things of value. I'm not for people scamming you and conning you and ripping you off by putting up pictures of their watches and lying about what they do and then playing games. Uh, check the spy. One point. Okay. Dance age. I will take a look. Uh, Chunkster, I haven't looked at the uh, T Doc. Gabriel Vienna, and I'll just run through these questions and then we'll move on to uh, the next part because we have some really cool stuff coming up that I am really excited to explain to you guys with DKNG and Snap and the, the way that they worked and how it changed the overall market because it, it ties into unusual whales, the overall markets, jobs report, a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm just going to move down this. What study is implied uh, about the implied volatility? Dan Sage, right here. It's relative volume, RVOL. Um, so it's an indicator. I told you I watched. It's price action, volume, that's all I'm looking at, right? Everything else is just pers like a little bit of help with perspective. I put this line here so I can visually see where a 147 is. I know I could watch it up here. It just helps a little bit. Um, you know, and I have the volume bars right here. And this is our vol. Our vol is relative volume. So you can see it spikes in the morning because it's way higher relative to typical volume. Um, let's see, when it's live flow, is that flow with your custom settings? Uh, Dan Sage, no, I, I remove more and more of the, I mean, I do have my DTE in there, but I remove a lot of the filters when I go to my live flow to watch it for the day because I'm just collecting names and things of interest. Um, what time frame are we looking at? Damalin, one minute. Um, but again, I don't care about candles. Anybody who does, I'll take a stop here to point two things out. Dan Sage asked about the ask side for my filters, and I see, um, let's see. And I also see, but doesn't IV try out through? Okay. So Damalin, we're looking at the one minute, but I always tell everybody, I don't, I don't care about candles. If you ever hear somebody giving you a candle rule, unfollow that person. They would be running a psychic hotline or selling diet pills if they weren't hustling in this industry. Finance just invites a lot of scammers. You know how like in the medis medical industry or when it comes to supplements, you could tell someone's lying because... They come off confident, but they talk about something where you could just understand that they don't know the details, right? They'll be like, oh, here's uh, this supplement and it makes your body produce like this energy and your enzymes come into play. And like to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Enzymes and bodily energy. To someone who does, you'd be like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. That's how these fakes uh, speak. So if you hear about like a one minute rule, a five minute rule, there's no rule. There's trillions of dollars being exchanged. If there was some super easy rule to game the system where you just watched for that one minute close or the five minute close, it would be the, the dumbest, easiest thing in the world. You'll see sometimes if you're playing the upside here, you don't have time. There was no closing. You were taking this, you were scalping it up. Here, we just had a consolidation period, sure, but you're watching price action and volume. If you went for a one minute close, you would actually grabbed it here and you'd have been stopped out, right? So none of that works. And the only thing that people do is they like to brag about it when it does work. They'll find, I mean, I could find an example if I call out five trades a day to the upside and downside. It gives you 10 possible plays per day where you might be able to go, see that candle? See how this happened? Oh, yeah, that's why I give that rule. Now you're a con artist with your fake little classes in Guru Channel. How are you running classes? You're not a pro on anything, right? Like, would you go to someone for your health if they weren't an accredited specialist whose background you could look into and who actually you scrutinize to see that they know what they're doing, forget the background. Would you go to them with your health? No. Why would you go to them with your financial health? 
that's your life. That's your family's life. That's your savings. So that's what I have to say there. Uh, and Dan Sage asked about the ask side. Anybody who tells you, I'm mean, hearing this circulate around, drives me crazy. I, I know there's other channels. I don't name names. I don't call people out because I don't, I just don't believe in it. I would rather teach you all the scams and then you know who they are and you can filter them out. Anybody who's saying, only look at the ask side. What are you talking about? That's not how this works. You can hit the bid side just because you negotiated on a large position. If you're buying $2 million of contracts, you can, you can put your bid in and you know that someone's going to pull back because of the volume that you're purchasing. Anybody saying that you rule that out has no idea about anything. They just memorize something they thought sound sensible because they say ask side means they're desperate. No, it doesn't. What are you talking about? This is just, again, unfollow block. It has no basis. It just sounds like something that could make sense. Um, and then the last one or two questions before we go into DKNG and Snap, because I'm really excited about those. Is it put call ratio, strong indicator of the flow or direction, or just Alexander Hamilton, just another data point. But, you know, data points are, are always good. You could look at it. If you can integrate it into your analysis, it's great. Um, but I don't pay place a lot of weight on it, right? Because you know, puts the calls, who's to, you have to filter by premium. And I know Unusual Whales does a good job of that as well. So it's all in perspective, right? Because if we looked at every put to call ratio, it could just be a bunch of retailers buying $100 worth of premiums. And then because we see a thousand transaction, then we see one call for 10 million. It's, you know, it's thousand to one, just to give you an idea. And the last one, and then we'll move on. Uh, okay, senior moments, catch you later. Thank you for coming. Snoopy Jag, J Snoop Jaggy Jag. In your flow analysis from the day before on AMD, how can you rule out the flow isn't simply related to institutions closing out a position? Okay, so I'm looking at conviction and you don't ever know anything 100%, but you you wanna be convicted to it. So what I saw there is they were actually, they weren't closing out positions, they were purchasing positions. Now, did I expect that institutions would? Well, yeah, that's also what creates downward pressure. I expected some uh, some profit taking. These contracts that we saw from Unusual Whales were opening positions with puts. Um, so you could say it's a hedge. I didn't feel like that was a very smart hedge play. I felt like that was a play for in the amount and the capital and the days to expiry. We had one day to expiry. That to me signals you have conviction to a downside move. That is not a simple institution uh, making some small adjustment. There is conviction to a downside move. Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's get into DKNG. We'll, we'll touch on BAC later. You know what? We'll, we'll actually do it really quickly. BAC was pretty straightforward. Had an easy opportunity. Gave us a moment. You know, sat here. Not a, a lot of consolidations on a quick move. But if you did take it, the thing that I want that I liked about BAC is it's a slow mover. So even on on this kind of move, I can understand some people taking. I'm usually not a big fan, but it held for a moment. Started to come back down. It is a slow mover. I actually also called out in the money options, which I don't always do, because I I try to approach a strategy. So this is going to sound interesting, and I I know the furus do not do this because they can't, and they're you'll see when I explain. I wanted to call out AMD because there's a little more. I liked it. I had high conviction, and I liked the idea that there was that volatility there because that can give us lots of space to the upside. I liked pairing it with BAC. I was also considering Wells Fargo. Uh, the reason that it paired so well is because this is a slower mover. So it's very beginner friendly. We know that it doesn't tend to make huge moves. If you look at the price, 44.70, this isn't even 30 cents. It just looks big because of the way that I've magnified it. it. Gives you a lot of time to get out, right? There's all this time, you're not making huge moves. So it's not as volatile. It's a little bit more beginner friendly. But yeah, I mean, if you took it as it broke down early, it's a Friday. I understand people being a bit more aggressive. You know, this was a great place to exit, but you had a little bit more time before it started pulling back. So BAC was an easy one. It was a good uh, good trade. And again, this was one where I adjusted the price level knowing, hey, it's it's well beyond the open, right? So this is where we open, comfortable with that. Let us get on the pullback. With the Furus, they start saying, hey, get your calls right here. Or, you know, maybe they have their calls up here or here. You go up and you're in and out. Or the puts are down here, right? If it goes below open, puts are down here. Look, they missed all that upside. Because again, it's just guesswork. You can always say calls here, puts here. Nonsense. All right, let's talk about DKNG and Snap. So we know that DKNG 
uh, ran and it didn't come back. We were actually looking for it to the downside. Uh, was this yesterday? Yeah, let me get us to the right day here. It's 30 day charts. So here's DKNG, yeah. This was our trigger, but this is for calls. So we didn't get in on this, that's okay. Uh, and I'm gonna explain a little bit more. DKNG took off and never came back, but you're gonna understand why I held my ground here and I was not willing to move my uh, my entry point. A lot of people were saying, you know, I saw a lot of 25, uh, 2650s being called up by different furos. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. And then we have Snapchat. So what's important about these two stocks and these two plays? Well, specifically with DKNG, and I could have inverted them as well. And this is actually missed by a penny, but I understand because of the way it gapped, a lot of people got in. All right, so what happened that's really, really different that isn't just about unusual whales or regular charting? We had a jobs report, right? And DraftKings, DKNG, is a consumer discretionary stock. So we're getting into a little bit of talk that we don't usually go over, but this is why I say it's nuanced. And as you grow as a trader, you're able to implement different things and factor in different data points, right? I talked about this once before with an analyst downgrade where I made a move on a firm after an analyst downgrade and it gave us an extra 80% on the trade. And it was kind of, it was an audible. It was something that I called in the morning because that's when the analyst downgrade came. So as I say, I'm always watching news. Uh, and you should be able to understand the news environment because it, it's a really big advantage. So the jobs report coming out, I knew that it was going to go one way or the other if we had strong news. So again, I like the pairing of Snap and DKNG, one heading to the upside and one is a breakdown. Um, this might have been one of the only few times where you could have maybe called up and down, and I'll explain why. So I knew that if we had a positive job report, <clears throat> there was a high chance DraftKings was going to take off and run, right? And Snapchat isn't a consumer discretionary, but it moves in sympathy with consumer discretionaries, right? And so you can see what we just ran all day long with uh, Snapchat. I'll zoom out here so you get a better look. I pull back at the end of the day, but by then you've taken so many profits. Um, and let's take a look at DraftKings. So consumer discretionary and the jobs reports coming out. Keep that in mind, right? So... I didn't want to move my trigger point down because I know for a fact, if you've, you're experienced, you'll look at it and you'll see that on the jobs report, sometimes we get a quick pop and then we tank if the market's actually disappointed. So, you know, you can call this a fake out. And this was a day where you really saw, like I posted this, I said, go look at your furos. Everybody got messed up by this. They didn't do well because they didn't understand it. And I saw a lot of the following said, oh, the market faked this out. No. No, no, no. That's your job to get ahead of that. There can be fake outs. There can be dips. And I just call it as, hey, we got stopped. You didn't get faked out. You didn't understand what was happening in the market. And it didn't align with your fake guru scam. And it was hard for you to answer. So you just said, oh, they got us. Who's they? No one cares about you. You don't have enough money to shake the market. Knock it off. But uh, what happened was, yeah, you can have a quick pop and then a drop. And you'll notice on days, let me bring your attention to this. When the Fed speaks, when Powell speaks, if you're watching, let's say, the SPY or the QQQ, you'll often see something like this. You'll see everything kind of slow down before he speaks because not a lot of people are hedging. Then as he starts speaking, you'll see a little bit of a jump and then a massive drop. Or you'll see a little bit of a drop and then a massive takeoff, right? And it is kind of like, I mean, I can see how it does fake everybody out, but no, the mark's not out to get you. So I set DKNG above. Um, and that's, I didn't want to trigger it to the downside if we just saw a little bit of a pullback, right? So if the market was actually happy with the jobs report, and then we just got that little bit of a pullback, people selling off, and then you got in thinking, oh, puts, 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 and then it ripped off, you would have been destroyed. So this was my puts. This was my short side, right? I kept it above, and I reiterated that before. I said, no, market's hard to read. I am not pulling back because I was concerned if I go a little bit under, you guys get triggered right here to get in on an early play, getting destroyed, right? And this is where I this is what I was looking at when I was making that decision. So I saw we were consolidating around here. So it'd be very natural for someone to just go, okay, go a little bit under, fake Furu style. I'm putting my entry levels here. And a lot of them did that, right? Because you're trying to trigger. I'm not trying to trigger so I could talk about it on Twitter. This pullback, I knew that the job market report could be a positive or negative 
and that we might see the what you want to call a fake out, a drawback really quick. So had I gotten in here and saying, oh yeah, the market's drawing back, everybody got in and you'd have gotten slaughtered. No, I want to see that it's convicted. When I see a convicted move up, then I know. Like if we go up here and then we pull back, I'm in. But we just saw continued pressure and I knew DKNG was done. But my strategy was I was going DKNG to the short side if we disappointed, right? DraftKings, if we disappointed consumer discretionaries, we're going to suffer. And I knew that we had sellers because I saw a bearish flow the day before. So remember that when I see a bearish flow, what is that telling me? Is it telling me 100% something's gonna happen? No, it's telling me something that somebody knows, right? And it also tells me that we have selling pressure, right? With Snapchat, it was the opposite. So I knew we were gonna get one of these trades and that's the point because we only need to get one and then everybody, everybody makes big money. Snapchat, I said, well, it's the same idea and I'm keeping it above because I want to see conviction to the upside. I don't want to see just like a little jump up and then a crash down, right? So here I am making my limits and I'm holding off, holding off. I'm saying, no, I want to go a little bit higher. I see some consolidation, but it, we're only getting in if I see it convicted off the start. Of course, we hit that and we take off. We never look back. So I was kind of playing both sides of the consumer, I'm sorry, the um, jobs report, which, yeah, one of them probably doesn't work out. But I know I have buyers for Snapchat. I know I have up, upward pressure and I know I have downward pressure of DKNG. So I go short on one, calls on the other, but my strategy protected us because nobody got into DKNG. And if you got into anything, it was only Snap. That's why I set my triggers a little bit away. I'm looking at data from the days before. I'm not getting pulled into these quick moves just so I can get a call out out. I'm trying to protect everybody so that we have easy trades to make money. And look at this. You could not have not made money if you entered this. Like, first of all, we never came back down to break even. So you couldn't have lost any money because we, we never came back, right? And then in terms of taking profits, you would have been hard pressed not to take a lot of profits, right? And DKNG, you would have never got in. Here we were. Where would you have gotten in? It was just straight up. And when it pulled back, it didn't come down to our entry and then just took off. So again, it was leveraging the jobs report understanding consumer discretionary securities, Snapchat moving as a sympathy play. Um, and that's how we did that. So let me take some more questions. I'll scroll back a bit and take a look here. Uh, feel free to ask anything that you'd like right here. Let's see. <clears throat> uh, Dan Sage, does IV dry out throughout the day? Um, sort of, Theta eats away options contract that hold for too long yes so as the day goes theta eats away that's one thing I explained in my DTE video people who don't understand theta think that oh that's just the overnight theta is never applied in any sort of even pattern it's a little bit all over the place if you ever analyze it um, there are people who specialize in this I'm not like a pure specialist in the statistics of how um, Greeks work and looking at the the functions but I, I've looked into it much deeper and I know what, uh, at, you know, an expert level for trading securities and trading options, it doesn't apply evenly. And that's something most people don't know. Uh, on a Friday, on a Friday, theta is in full force because it will erode all of your extrinsic value. That's the most clear way to explain it. People say it's going to go at this rate. It's going to go at that rate. By the end of the day, there will be no extrinsic value in your options contract it will be only intrinsic value so for those who don't know it's good to like to go brush up and look at this more in depth Ex extrinsic value it means the value in your stock above where the close is so if you're at a 47 dollar um call and let's say your premium is you know three dollars and the stock is at 47 dollars is three dollars in extrinsic value the intrinsic value is aligned to your premium and what you have in the underlying. Um, I know that might have not been a perfect example, but I would recommend looking into that. So again, your extrinsic value will be eroded by the end of the day. And only what you have in the money will yield you your value. So it's being eaten away on a Friday. In the week, it just moves slowly. Um, <clears throat> and IV drying out? No, not necessarily. One thing we do know is that heavy IV in the morning, that's just a fact. It's high volatility period. We tend to see that at the end of the day as well. But there are IV spikes and peaks and valleys all throughout the day, depending on the move. So IV can go up and down at any point. Uh, it doesn't sort of just dry out. Um, let's see. 
why one force I think I touched on that. Let's take a look through these questions. What resources would you recommend for an options trading education? Chunkster. Uh, following my account, but also two more things. One, unfollow all these scammers because it's just going to mess you up. Not because they want you to just follow me. I, you know, I don't care. Follow people who know what they're talking about. Follow analysts, uh, CFAs, people who are legitimate, right? And it's hard to tell who's legitimate. Just assume most aren't. Also, spend some time on things like Investopedia. Understanding definitions of things properly and seeing them in context is extremely important. I think a lot of people hear things and they kind of understand in context, but they don't have a deep understanding. Always have a deep understanding because the deeper your understanding of something, the better you can apply it, right? When you kind of understand something, you get into certain use case scenarios where you get confused and you never want to be confused and panicked in a real trading situation. It leads to bad decisions. I hope that helps. How did you start your trigger point? Yeah, there'll be a deeper video, but I kind of touched on that just now for a few of the securities. Um, you can use, so with this DKNG, you would enter right away at the open when the price breaks above trigger. Uh, for DKNG, what we're looking at, I mean, it didn't break the trigger because this was to the downside, right? I put I had puts on this. I was waiting for it to get above. Remember, I had it above because I didn't want a quick jump from the jobs report then to come crashing down. Just like with Snapchat, I did the opposite. I didn't want a, a quick dip then to come flying up on it. So, uh, or sorry, or vice versa. So there would have been no entry here. Now, had I called calls on this? Yeah, I might have jumped in right here. But again, that's opening range. That's not for everybody. Um, would you scale in just in case it pulls back? Yes, you can. You. I do that sometimes, absolutely. Um, I, and I certainly never go full on position first thing in the morning. Uh, that's a little bit more dangerous. If I do, I'm definitely not calling that out to everybody else because then it's just reckless and too dangerous for the average person. Uh, isn't it harder to point out consolidation on a higher time frame? If you notice consolidation on one minute time frame over five to 10. Yeah, um, so consolidation has nothing to do with the candles, right? It's the time period and it's the Snoopy Jag, Jag Snoop Jaggy Jag. I keep saying Snoopy. Um, I like beagles, right? Snoopy was a beagle, peanuts, so. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big dog person. I like animals in general, except for the ones that kill people, uh, bad animals. So yes, yeah, Snoopy, Snoop Jaggy Jag, it keeps saying it, man. It's, you're just going to be Snoopy today. So yeah, that's one of the things on higher time frames. things look a little bit different. If you're just following the candle, yeah, it's it's much harder to, to look at it as any consolidation period. But if you take that into proper perspective and say, oh, well, I'm on a, I'm on a five minute period, then you're recognizing that, yeah, we are consolidating or a 15 minute period. Well, if the, the price is kind of staying in the same general range and it's sitting right at, let's say that this was a, let's say this was a 15 minute candle. If I just see this and the candle's about this size, I know that we're consolidating. So time frames are just perspective. Can it make it a little bit harder? It depends. You have to adjust your perspective. If you know that you're on a five minute candle and you see it sit somewhere, well, then you know we've been here for five minutes. If you see it on a one minute candle, for some people it's easier to view and they go, oh, look how many candles we have at this, um, at our trigger point. It might be easier for you to visualize and say, we've had many, I feel like we're consolidating. I see the range a little bit more clearly. I like more data than less. So it's not that it's necessarily harder. It just depends on how you interpret what you see, but I can understand, I understand your point and hopefully that give you some perspective there and say, you just have to appreciate what time frame you're on, right? I mean, if you looked at an hourly chart, it would just be one candle going from here to here, right? Because that's what we did in an hour. Um, Robbie Smith, great info. When are you going to start charging cash for premium service? <laughs> I did that for a living. I work with private clients. I still I run private equity, and I, I do still work with a few private clients I advise with, uh, and I consult for private equity, but that's separate. Uh, do you mean, if you mean like a Discord or something like that? I, just, I don't see value in it. I just, I mean, I'm trying to find ways to engage better with people. I don't see value in some giant Discord channel. I, I don't know. I don't see how I could do that to, to help people out. Um, for what I'm doing here and what I'm doing on Twitter, I'm not charging for that. If I want money for something, I tell everybody in advance what I want and uh, we'd agree on it or, you know, I'd, I'd have something else. Uh, yeah, there's just no interest or plans for any kind of service. But like I said, I, I do 
have um, some private work that I do, and, and I'm trying to figure out how we can engage with, with certain people better, but um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, I might have missed it before. Are those tools your favorite? If so, why? Uh, DSSA and which tools? Do you mean indicators? Um, just let me know on your question and I will respond. Would you add the position when it pulls back to the trigger price? Yeah, sometimes uh, you can hoop uh, as long as we're, we're upside. So let's say, let's use snap, right? Snap is a good one here. Okay. Yeah. So let's say snap, I enter here, or let's say I don't. And then we get a run up and it pulls back and then we're here. Would I re-enter? Yeah, absolutely. You can re-enter. Um, just I'd be watching for things, right? Like there's no binary answer. And this is where I'll stop again and tell you what to ignore. When people give you black and white answers, it means they can't speak to the nuance. It's not that the nuance isn't important. It's they don't understand it. So they're not mentioning it. I might get in here. Uh, you can who um, it just depends if I see just a quick if I see like a breakdown coming all the way down, I might not enter it because I call that a falling knife. If I see a flash drop and then we start pulling back up, I might even catch it up here instead of here because I might feel confident that, you know, I have an opportunity to buy at a discount. And I'm always keeping an eye on the uh, options matrix. Sometimes people will panic when they see a quick move down and they will give me a much better entry. It, I did this on something I was scalping the other day and we were at about 27, 25 bid ask. And I saw a quick move down and I saw the bids dry up and the highest bid was 21 cents, which I thought was over dramatic. So I just came in aggressively at uh, 22, then 23, and I got filled. And then when we pulled back up, you know, within seconds, I was ahead about three, four cents in my position, which again, that's a little bit more of an advanced play. I wouldn't try to do that, but yeah, I can do those things. And uh, I got questions. What date expiry range would you use for EW filters? I got questions, I got answers. I like this little back and forth we can have like that. I made a full video on DTE, so check it out, it's on this channel. Um, and I'd show you which ones that I use. Tom Marcus, appreciate you too. Um, enjoy your YouTube live, I've learned a lot from your Twitter. Okay, do we have any, um, okay. Any other questions, guys, get your questions in. This is the open question and answer session. Like I said, this isn't a fake furu hour, so Ask me the hard ones or the good, the bad, whatever you want. Um, and maybe we could do, even do a quick one minute or two minute ask me anything. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I might have used the wrong term, the implied validity, volatility. And, oh, DSSA. And, so yeah, DSSA is asking if the implied volatility and relative standard deviation that I have below the chart are my go-to filters. These are two ones that I, that I look at. Yeah, they're on all my charts. Yeah, so volume price action because they all they're all of them are real right this isn't sort of like a guesswork calculation of you take it at the nine when it breaks the nine ema and you get out and then you get back in at the nine ema knock it off the people who say that don't even understand the ema calculation i don't even remember what the exact calculation was because it's a complex formula um but it's the nine exponential moving average and they're simple moving averages as well people don't know what they're talking about they just you know they're the same people look in the sky and see it's a rabbit no it's a bird seeing cloud patterns. Yes, this is real. This gives me an understanding of relative activity, um, volume relative to other time periods that are similar and to other days. Important. Applied volatility, not as important, but it lets me kind of peek down and see it. I can tell what the volatility looks like based on price action because I'm watching the options chart. I can tell based on the moves. So that gives me a good idea. Uh, and then of course, volume and price. That's it. You know, there's no magic indicator, right? It's not that easy. If there was all we'd ever do is turn on an indicator and just say, oh, when it when it goes above and goes below. And I've been meaning to remove both these anyhow. Um, but yeah, like here's here's VWAP. Well, here's it's above VWAP. Ah, oh, you would have been stopped out. You would have been back in. Ah, oh, you would have been stopped out. You're back in, right? The same thing with a 9 EMA. You're in and out, in and out. It doesn't make sense. Be convicted and understand. You'll do much better. Um, I'll go watch after the live. Okay. Do you see XPEV going back to the ATH? I don't know, Greenbeam 9, I'm not looking at XPEV. Um, Michael Chambers, good good question, yeah. Um, you've seen me say it a few times that players, the big players have gotten the move that they wanted. Can you expand? Sure, sure. So, good example, AMD, right? Um, let me pull us up to today and I'll show you what I mean. Why does TD always start me back there? So. 
I feel like at this point, right, this is where our profit taking should be just because we I cannot tolerate the losses and high volatility. There's no reason for us. We're on the retail side. Stack your money. Put it in the bank. Take care of your family, your bills, the things that you need to pay in your life. So I'll call for us to take profits. But as in terms of the big players, I feel like after a significant move down, right, they've made their money. And I'm taking a look at where they entered. So I understand their exposure based on where they entered yesterday, what kind of move we've seen in the after hours, right? And then where we've had significant volume to give them an opportunity to move out of their positions or, um, you know, how far we've run. So if once we're here, I feel like those playing to the short side, and this is just a generalization, but we're down a few points. Those who came in hard on the bear side, they've made their money. I feel like the ride that we were taking with them, I don't have as high conviction um, that we're going to keep pushing down. We could, right? And we did, right? So so call me wrong here. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I, I will tell you what I know and what I don't know. I don't know what's going to go all the way here. Like, that's why I would tell people, take your profits here. I know how to be a profitable, successful trader. But I feel like I can gauge based on the exposure point from the buyer and based on the move that's occurred. If they've made good money, I'm looking back at them because I'm trying to ride their move. I feel like they've already gotten their move. If they get more, great. If it reverses on us, well, I'm glad I'm not part of it. But I want to get in for what I'm con what I'm confident is their move. Hopefully that helps you understand. So if I see that they've gotten their move, I don't want to get in. So if we're here and someone says, is, is it still a good time to take AMD? I'm going to say, no, it's nowhere near our trigger. So no, that's that's why I do things the way I do. Now, they might look back the next day and say, oh, dude, I asked you if it was a good time to get in. I'd have made a lot of money. Sure. But I don't know that, right? That's guesswork. That's furu talk where they won't answer you and go, oh, I would have told you yes, man, definitely. <laughs> right? Because they always know. They're always right. No, that's not the way discipline trader works. I don't know that we're going to do this towards the end of the day. I feel like they've had their move. Okay. So thanks VIP Studio. Uh, said best channel on YouTube. Is it good to check on usual whales after your calls to see volume already purchased? Um, Mikhail Young, can you expand on that? Let's see. Von Stein, I know this is advanced, but how do you know when to start building a position, blow a trigger versus knowing that the move isn't going to happen like in DKNG? You're right, it is advanced. Um, I don't want to touch on that too much because one of the most dangerous things people can start doing is jumping the gun on triggers without, you know, having their due diligence and being experienced and scaling in. And this is this is why, because if I say I think a move is coming, right, and I buy in on AMD, and this is kind of a weak example, but I buy in here because I think there's going to be a move to the upside, right? Well, then. I'm going to be tempted to buy in here as well and scale in a position. This is the this is a part that's really dangerous, and I will not recommend anything that I think is going to be dangerous and could hurt traders. So I know some advanced, and this is part of the thing is, I think there's I have uh, seven thousand five hundred followers on the page, which I appreciate and I love that. But everybody at different levels, it's difficult to sort of integrate some things that are for some people and others. Because when you're a newer trader, you kind of feel like, oh, it's advanced. Oh, he's giving them the good stuff, <laughs> right? It's not. It's discipline trading. You can grow your account to hundreds and thousands of dollars off of a smaller investment over time through discipline trading just by sticking to the fundamentals and being a good trader without advanced techniques. So the problem with scaling in is everybody will start feeling like, well, when do I stop scaling my position in, right? Because I got a discount here to the upside, uh, but then I came back here and you're looking on your screen and you're seeing red and you know that. You might be down 10%, it's time to exit, but then you tell yourself, yeah, but if I buy more here, I adjust my average down. Now we're in dangerous territory. If you don't know and you're not convicted, you could put your entire account into scaling down your position and then sit around hoping for a move up. And if it doesn't come, you blew past your stops and you're in a lot of trouble. So I will, ahead of trying to blow up my account or nonsense like that, I'm always gonna tell you guys straight and um, try and protect you from things that are volatile. But I do acknowledge that there may be people who are curious in more advanced trades. Um, yeah, so I'll try to figure something out there. RS, are you always buying the bid or sometimes also the ask? Rarely the ask. Um, depends on the move in the stock. If I really want to get in, I will hit the ask. I'll even 
hit above the ask if it's fast moving the spreads are tight but I am minding the spread I don't want to get in on a big spread and start 10% behind because then I'm almost ready to exit so it really depends if I have an opportunity I like to go in the middle uh, I won't often go exactly at the bid because I have high conviction on my trades right high conviction on my trades makes me comfortable with going in above the bid how much above the bid well the other side of that is I don't like to start too far behind so I won't go very far off um, if you enter position and the trade stops moving will hold the position overnight or get out because of the Delta Alexander Hamilton I'm out that's it it was the day trade one of the most dangerous things is when things don't go people's way or they're unhappy you go from being a day trader to a long-term trader or a swing trader no 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 you got in as a day trade your idea didn't work out right if I'm minus four percent and the day's closing I'm out there's I am risking overnight volatility plus the theta changes to the stock news announcement no why because I don't I'm not happy that I had to take a four percent loss when it closes I'm out it hasn't hit my stop loss hasn't hit my profit target obviously if I'm still in the trade I'm out wherever it is that's it you could try and wait all the way to the last minute if you want to gamble but I'm out by the end of the day and I usually don't wait till the very last minute because I don't want to get stuck um, how many days back is your chart time frame one minute one day uh, right now Dan Sage this is a one minute 30 day um, but usually I'm just one minute one day I don't need the extra time when I'm looking daily RS how did you get in contact with unusual whales with your own experience as a licensed trader um, no I'm not sure how the my experience as licensed trader ties in but how did I get in touch with unusual whales unusual whale, unusual whales uh, got in touch with me and they I know I mean I've been a CEO of some pretty big businesses I do not know the owner himself um, unusual whales I, I imagine it's a developer someone who's, who's really really hyper focused and that's why he's doing such a great job whoever it is it's someone who has hired someone to work on his behalf um, who recruits people to you know partner with unusual whales so that's the person I spoke with but I've I've never been in touch directly with um, the person behind unusual whales I, I've been in touch with whatever you want to call it their affiliate manager or um, sales rep however I didn't really present as any formal title but yeah they they contacted me or he contacted me right which which would be his job right to find people and reach out because his job is to try to grow the business right that's what you do in sales um, so yeah we spoke and had some good conversations yeah what you characterize as a falling knife flash drop slow grinding move down good question um, this is more of a flash look how quickly it happened just in seconds and you see that it starts pulling up sometimes you might even be able to get these prices when we've already seen it pull up this big um, this is a um, little bit oh we're a little too close there it just got right in my face this is a bit of a breakdown right this is a this is a bit more of a falling knife like if you're trying to get in and you got in here it's a bit more of a falling knife you know or if you got in here does it bounce up yeah but it's still a, it's a really big move and uh, you might suffer on the theta I'm sorry on the IV there are better examples but I'm just using the chart in front of us so take those and imagine them a little bit more extreme uh, any chance you can review NVAX? Uh, I would want to do a little bit more due diligence, uh, J. Bangulo. Just because I want everybody to get the most out of this video. I don't want to kind of be sitting here thinking to myself, pulling things up, trying to figure it out. Uh, okay. Snoop Jaggy Jag. There, gotcha. Call this. I'm also fine with you calling me Snoopy. Awesome. I like beagles. I think I'll, I've mentioned that before. I don't mention very many personal things, but I, I think I've said before, I, I like animals. I like dogs. I have a dog. I have a beagle, as you would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised to know. But her name is not Snoopy. It's a she. Um, what is your percentage of your conviction based on unusual whales? It's a data point. It's an important data point with unusual whales. When I'm playing options, uh, I'd say that's a good piece of it. But again, it's impossible to assign a specific percentage of my overall and this is a great question overall conviction to one element or another I'd say unusual whales makes up a high percentage of that but it also depends what I see right so if I see a strong bearish flow on unusual whales like really strong and there's nothing else and that sticks out and it's unusual then that is a pretty pretty powerful piece of my analysis now if I see something on unusual whales but I see some conflicting data I'm not going to put as much weight on it right like if I see news that maybe pulls me in a different area 
or I see a bit of a weaker flow on unusual whales, but I see news and some indications and I believe we're overbought that point to the bear side, I will com I kind of compile everything and put them together to, uh, to formulate my overall conviction. So I say there's no magic bullet. It's the combination of multiple elements, right? So what if there's like amazing um, bullish flow, the greatest bullish flow you've ever seen in your life, and that morning we hear, um, you know, we're going to war, something absolutely catastrophic happened and, you know, there's a natural disaster. Are you still going to play the upside? No, you're probably going to be like, I'm not touching this. And if I'm touching anything, I think we're going to have a market crash, right? So a lot of things will combine. I won't just take one and run with it. This is, again, Furu style. Understand the full market and you can you can better, um, you know, put formulate your trade thesis. Amazing Hazen, appreciate you as well. I will try to avoid buses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I will be here. I'm, I'm happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, I think I already went over Netflix a little bit more with uh, Mac Fan John. Yeah, we talked about that in uh, in the threads. Uh, hold up, Dave Wisely. This is a good question. All right, so this is a bit more um, on the macro side of the market. Do you think that people and institutions held off taking profits until after the first of the year in order to push their tax liability to 2023? Absolutely, this happens. Now, is that the only thing that happens? No, it really is specific to your own tax position. Think of it as a, from an individual standpoint. One thing I like to do to help understand when you think of a big complex situation, make it smaller than it is. Really in anything in life, when something is really big, just make it smaller. Like public speaking, they say you're talking to all these people, just be like, I'm talking to people, right? Simplify it sometimes just to get past it. Uh, it depends on your specific scenario. Think about it as an individual. If you had a blowout 2021, you made a lot of money. Would you then want to, if you took any, you took losses in the market, would you sell so that you could declare your losses? You probably would because it decreases your tax liability. Now, if you're, you're planning that for the next year and you think, well, no, I had a great year this year, maybe, uh, sorry, I didn't have a, such a good year this year and I don't need it, right? But I think next year is a little bit foggy and it's not as clear. You may push off to the next year to decrease your tax liability and have that option or arrow in your quiver. Hopefully that makes sense, Dave Wisely. So uh, different institutions, different positions, everybody moving based on their own uh, tax situation. How often will you post videos do live sessions like these? RS, loving your YouTube channel. Uh, I try to do at least a couple times a week. I think we'll try to do a live every week. Um, Marty Nobles, have you ever tried, traded it? Trady ticks. I have not. No, I don't know about it. Conviction of plays. Any relevance to your list order? <laughs> no. Uh, underway, sort of. I mean, sometimes I'll list ones that are a little bit more top of mind, almost as a slip, and I've acknowledged that at the top. But I'll put it this way. I'm convicted with anything I say because anything I list is coming out of my mouth. It's going into public. I have skin in the game, right? That's what I call these fake furus on I have skin in the game. I have a reputation, not only as a professional trader, as a CEO, I'm very well known in that space. Uh, you know, I received reward awards, as you guys saw. I take it very seriously. I don't like saying things that I cannot support, even in over small things. I will not say anything to someone, you know, unless I'm joking around, that I don't stand behind. So if I write something out there, I just put my name on it, I'm convicted. In the rare case, Underway 1000, I might mark it. I've only ever done this once and I put fire logo beside a firm and I said like we're gonna go in the morning I made my adjustment I want everybody to know and that crushed it in the morning but it's very rare if you ever see like a fire logo beside something probably means I'm really bullish on that having like a quick move and it stands out um, hopefully I don't ever accidentally put one up there um, but I, I usually check it over do you do the same amount of DD for day swing trades versus holding a long-term equity yeah Similar, but it's different. It's different diligence. Um, yeah, it's, it's different. And also my stop losses are different for long-term equity. Uh, when I'm managing private equity, there are different strategies, right? Sometimes it, we have to factor in our use of derivatives. And this is where it gets complex, our use of derivatives with underlying. So if I have a large position in something, um, I may adjust my risk tolerance based on how I'm leveraging derivatives. Make that simple. So if I have AMD and I'm willing to tolerate a 5% pullback on the underlying security, 
I also keep in mind that if AMD is very profitable to me in writing options, because if like I build a large position, uh, you know, about 2,500 shares, and we're writing options contracts and we're receiving a good premium, we're taking that into account. I almost run each stock as its own little business. When Again, this is more complex private equity stuff. But you almost have to look at each stock as its own little business that has its own P&L. So if I say, look, I like the performance, right? Uh, I want to expand our risk tolerance here because we're doing so well on the derivative side and writing options and collecting premium because there's volatility here and we're getting high premiums. That might change the way that I approach um, maintaining it in my portfolio. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Rajiv Kumar, thank you. Uh, Jordan Rhodes, are you looking at one day or multiple days? Uh, I keep in I keep information on multiple days, but it's weighted, right? So yesterday's information will be a little bit more weighted, all relative to the day before, and so on and so forth. Now, if the day before was forty million dollars in premiums and yesterday was two hundred thousand, when I say all relative, I mean it's also relative to the premium and expiry dates, etc. Um, Gortech Gill, please make a full video. Yeah, I think it does deserve a full video. And I'll just take a few more questions, and then we'll jump into a quick AMA because it's New Year's, and we'll, we'll have fun for just a minute or two. Um, trigger level if possible. Yep. Um, you can who that's going to be a full series of videos because as you've heard, I've talked about what are some of the things I've mentioned. Like again, I want I want everybody to, to key in on some of the things that I say. I've talked about jobs reports, so economic events, right? I've talked about making adjustments on my trigger points based on news and filtering news that in itself is like a 10 part video because not all news is the same like if you just see an update here like Barron's picks that's not news right or just some little article some of them might be because somebody important says something that could hurt the stock some of them could be useless you'll see an analyst downgrade which is what I use to help make us more money that's useful you know it's there's so many things AMD could be talking about their semiconductor production so just understanding news, uh, it takes a lot of familiarizing yourself. So uh, let's see. Taking your calls all January. I'm three for the three this week, Mikhail Young. Yeah, just practice good risk management and management of your position, whatever you do, Mikhail Young. It doesn't matter for anybody. Sonny, can you swing trade for those of us who can't day trade due to nine to five job? Yeah, I mark some of my stocks as um, swings. And that means that they're just a little bit less volatile. But of course, always do your due diligence before you decide to hold overnight. Have a good one, man. Uh, thanks for your time. I have to leave now. Great. Snoopy. <laughs> Snoop. Jaggy Jag. I'm using TD Web Broker as 2S is not offered for Canadians. Unfortunately, I'm happy with the Visa customer service for Canadians. Is your recommendation traders use interactive brokers? Absolutely. Um, I have some friends in Canada who switched over and they're like, it's night and day. One of them was using web brokers. And one of them was using, oh man, one was using Quest Trade and also BMO Simple, BMO, BMO Pro, something like that. They're like, it's, it's night and day. Purple indicator TY7552, this is Arval. Changes color on how much, uh, how high the Arval goes. So, yeah. And... Day trading options, you analyze Greeks going to a trade or more just direction of trading volatility. I do analyze the, the uh, Greek stand stage. I'm looking at theta, delta as the primaries. I also see vega and some of the other in, in gamma. Um, data and delta are probably the most important to understand. Would you recommend unusual whales for the news feed? Sure. Wherever you feel comfortable getting your news, I also have my news feed here live with uh, TD. Um, you know, unusual whales post as it does, so... Why is it you don't really trade mega caps, DF? Well, I, you know, AMD is sort of like a mega caps, but it's a good question. I've touched on this before. DF, mega caps, the problem is that there's so much data, it's very difficult to parse, to make heads and tails of. And there's so much data for so many different reasons. There are large institutions with very large positions who are constantly writing, buying options based on hedges, more so than anywhere else. So what that does is it clouds the information. Now, furus love it because there's high liquidity. So no, they know when they play their scam of calls and puts, they can never be wrong. There's always going to be a lot of volume. That's why they sprinkle in so many mega caps. Go look at the data. It's very difficult to parse. Uh, and if I don't have high conviction, I won't take something. But I think AMD is a really big one. But look at that data that I had on AMD. Highly convicted on it. So I go in. I don't try to fake and I won't use them as a crutch. 
But if you see guys are constantly cycling the large caps, that's why they're doing it, because there's liquidity and volatility. Like Tesla, right? If this was the open for Tesla and you're a fake furu, you can just set a call here and a put here. You're almost certain that it's going to run because Tesla's volatile. It goes up and down. It'll trigger for you and then you'll be like, oh, I called it. And you know, there's a lot of volume. So you go, oh yeah, volume over here, take it. So what was the man, name of the broker you mentioned? Um, IBKR, Interactive Brokers. I got some questions. I put up a tweet there. It just scrolled through my feed. I put it. Um, Craig asked you in for, enter for a confirmation, enter a trade. No, I let things consolidate and I watch IV, but I don't enter on like a one minute close or a five minute close. Anybody telling you that, unfollow them. It's just they're making clear that they don't know what they're talking about. Okay. Uh, guys were running down to the last minute or two. I will just, just for kicks, it's New Year's. I'll give you guys, um, let, let's take five minutes. Ask me anything. Maybe uh, trading related or un, un, not completely trading related. Just to keep in mind, you know, I'm not really a specialist outside of trading. Um, thank you, Snoop Jaggy Jag. Thank you, Snoopy. Uh, does it play a role when they're jumped into the trade? How does relative volume help? Relative volume just gives me an indication on price action and implied volatility um, is really tells me what's happening with the spread. So are we overbidding, underbidding? Is the price moving up because there's higher volatility? So the higher the volatility, the more the price is gonna move up when we see wider spreads. Uh, size of your positions, Craig. Um, size of my personal positions, it varies, right? It varies on a lot of things. Home state, um, from underway 1000 home state my home state that i'm from uh i was actually born in canada but i would say my home state might be new york that was the first place that i kind of grew up in uh yeah i mean i grew up in canada but then i was in new york maybe i moved to i lived in nevada i lived in um where did i live new york state we have you know we do summers in uh colorado my wife and i we like it there but uh yeah that, texas is my home state that's <clears throat> where I live. I've lived here since 2012. Sunny, dogs or cats? Dogs. Love dogs. I don't know. I don't. It's not like I hate cats. It's just I love dogs. Might do a video on how to set up IB care for trading. Thank you so much for your help. Yeah, I'll see if I can get some tips and tricks there or even just open up the questions so everybody can help each other. I like the idea of the community helping each other. My best and worst personal tickers for 2021. Hmm. Good question. Uh, I'd have to think about that, Dan Sage. I'm not sure. Kevin Fatkin, how do you feel about using things like credit spreads and condors to take advantage of stocks or moving sideways over long periods of time? Uh, good question, Kevin Fatkin. So there are so many different option spreads out there. I think I mentioned this on the feed. I, I took in a conference call, just a seminar on some of the new ones, and it's wild. Like they've got all kinds of new names. I don't do that a lot. Um, in the right market conditions, spreads like that can make sense. And you can have bullish and bearish spreads as well, not just things like iron condors, which are sort of sideways movers. If you're, I know people, so I don't do that very often. Um, that's not really for me. I, I feel like I could do better. Just I convict to the upside and downside. I usually don't have conviction sideways because that just means the data is mixed and it doesn't mean I'm confident we'll go sideways. But I do have some friends and, and former colleagues and contacts who just, make a make a pure living a great living off of uh doing spreads so in the right market conditions i think that you can sort of take advantage of that but it, it's not really where i find the best roi in my time what is the biggest success you had on trading and uh what was the factor behind it that made it successful um i don't know short term long term uh you, you guys have noticed that i don't really brag and the thing you know what part of the way I'd, I don't like to brag because I don't like braggers. Um, you guys will look at my history. So it would be hard to know whether I had money because I was a, a tech CEO, whether I was Fortune 50 or from my trading. So it's like, that's why I say about other people. You don't even know where their money comes from or if it's real. So I could say, oh, I have millions because of A, B, C, or D. But you wouldn't know. And I, I just don't like to lie. I don't know. I don't know. Um, single trade. What was the biggest single trade? Um, it might have been a long swing on, on Tesla early on. And that was just within the private equity. You know, we, we bought underlying. We also we also bought calls a little bit further out. Um, I think that was it. Big big factors. We knew, you know, we saw adoption. We saw a growing market, new space. So we were pretty uh, pretty bullish on it. Yeah. 
and it, and it was uh, you know it was, it was in the upper six figures for us, but I yeah. Zappa two thousand one is your female beagle's name Snoopat? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not Snoopat. Uh, what was your first big trade as a professional? Uh, wasn't it? it's not Exxon Mobil? Um, I got some questions asked. What was your first big trade as a professional? That went my way. I had a lot of really big trades that I lost money on. Huge trades that wiped out my account. <laughs> no, so those, those were tons of those. Um, but then I started getting good at it. I think it was, I'm trying to remember the name of it. For some reason, I'm thinking politician. Neighbors, that's it. I think it was on Neighbors. Um, yeah. And the other one might have been on Second Gen, Amgen. No. I think it was on Neighbors in the, in the uh, fossil fuel space. That was my biggest as, as a professional. Oh, you meant as a professional. I was just telling you in my personal account. As I worked as a professional, um, doing a good job with clients, I was just trading like an idiot on my own because you know I was trying to catch up to everybody else around me who was just doing so great. So market design, market's the scam designed to take my money. Nope, but it's a dangerous place that will gladly take your money, Von Stein, if you don't protect it. Dave Wisey, doggies are the best. I agree. Start the option too much. Uh, Two months out, so they haven't even that data. Um, Michael Chambers, if you want to give me the example, I'll I'll take a look at it. Um, Jay Bagnula, are you a hedge fund hired shill sent infiltrate retail movements? Is the silence uh, making you uncomfortable? <laughs> no, I would have to disclose it if I was actually. Back when I was a um, professional trader, I did constantly disclose it and it, it actually sucked because anytime I opened an account, a brokerage anywhere, I had to disclose that I was a pro trader so my account got marked as pro and I'd get random little audits where I don't get a fill. They would just hold my order for X amount of time before filling it. I'd be like, oh cool, thanks guys. I was really hoping to get in at this trigger point but that's cool, I'll take it 20% away and immediately stop out. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Advice to tell you new options trader going to 2022, Dan Sage Discipline. Learn, tune out the con artists. Tune them out. They're killing everybody. That's why people are dropping out. The one in the 10,000 are the ones that they highlight who do well because they YOLO, and they'll eventually lose it too. And all the losers just get um, just kind of muted out. Both wins and losses. Yeah. Uh, losses, like it was everything back in the day when it first started. S Snoopy. As you were born in Canada, are you exclusive Toronto Raptors supporter, right? Uh, yeah, it's a question here. Raptors supporter. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, sort of, but I also live in Texas. And I'm in Houston right now, so the Rockets too. But I I, I do cheer on, on the Raptors a bit. I'm not a... I don't, I don't watch basketball or follow very closely, but I follow closely enough. I like sports. Goal per year in the market, five, six, or seven figures. Not five or six. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thanks, Chumster. How do you choose your triggers? Uh, we said we're going to have a video on that. Have you had any fours come at you negatively privately? Nope. Um, nope. I've had a bunch of them block me. Um, and then I posted something saying, just FYI, when people block me, I never call anybody out by name. So if you block me, that means you're reading what I'm saying and you think it's about you or you're essentially saying you know it's about you. So I said that and then, I, and then a bunch of them <laughs> unblocked me. Uh, no, but I think they're afraid to write me directly because they know that I'm fully transparent with all of you guys and they're probably worried I'd just be like, hey, this uh, idiot just wrote me. Um, so yeah, I think they're worried about that. Uh, but they have done things to try to have other people get in touch with me to see if I can not talk about them. So I, I, won't, I won't detail that too much. But yeah, the Furus have, uh, they've taken note and they're nervous. But that, again, that tells me that tells me that you're doing something wrong because if you're getting people asking me to stop talking about you, I haven't named anybody's name, right? I've never named a name. So if you're getting nervous off me just explaining the scams, that means you're engaging in the scam. Uh, Fab Monthly, going to just roll out the last questions that I see and then we'll end it here. What's your end game here? Working on a product for your following to buy into? Uh, no, I'm not working on a, a product right now. Um, I just divested some business interests. I think if we could find a good product, that'd be great. Um, but no, I don't have anything planned out here. I, I'm enjoying myself. I think if I just ruin the furus and then disappear into the sunset with everybody understanding what to do, that, that works. Or maybe we could do, maybe we could find something great. Maybe you could find some great little calculator that everybody just makes money off of. Uh, I don't know, Sonny. We'll see. 
Thanks for continuing your insights. Great stuff. Amazon below 200 simple SMA. I don't go based off the SMAs. Happiness in life besides profits taken uh, from Craig's family, my friends, my dog. Um, yeah, pretty easy going. I like coffee. I'm, I'm a sports fan. Um, pretty pretty easy and simple going. I think that's a good thing and a good attitude to have for this line of business because you're less, you know, if you're all about like the cars and the flash and you're, you're ready to scam everybody, you don't really care about things that are important. Yeah, that's the stuff that, that makes me tick. Like when I just get to take some time, hang out with my friends or my wife and we just go for coffee or walk the pup on, um, pup watch, walk our dog on the, on the trail or something. I love that. Uh, last two here is gambling addiction, a taboo topic within the market environment. Um, no groove stock gambling addiction isn't a taboo topic. I don't think so. Um, it can be discussed and I could see how gambling addiction could, you know, melt into stock trading. A lot of people trade stocks like they're gambling. I think a lot of the people on Twitter who are trying to engage in stock trading are trying to scratch the itch that is gambling. Uh, and I tried to tell people not to gamble. Um, how many hours after Mark closed, he's been researching the next day? Um, you know, at least three, four plus. Yeah. Uh, thanks for what you're doing. And then here we go. Last two. Where in Houston do you stay? I'm in Clear Lake. I'm closer to the core. I'm not sure where Clear Lake is. I don't know where a lot is because we moved here during like all the lockdown and stuff. So I never got a chance to explore back then. And, and I still haven't really explored. Um, what you share people pay to get money. Yeah, I share what people pay money to get. Awesome. Good. Good. Stop paying money to fake con artists. If you find somebody good and they're legit, and they're, they're going to be your mentor, go, go do your thing. That's great. But Watch out for the con artists, 99% of them. Look forward to taking big profits on your chart. You have a white dotted line, solid line. What are these? Yeah, no, I'm just gonna, this does, it just helps me know my trigger. These, and I keep deleting it, but I didn't save it. So I have to save it in my setup. See my profits taken setup up here. Um, so it comes back, that's the 9 EMA and the R vol, but I, I just don't use them. I used them once or twice, explained something to a few friends, uh, how they don't work. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm still learning the best of usual whales. Okay, so I think that's about it for all the questions. Um, yeah, thanks guys. Save your questions, think them up. A lot of them will come up in contact. Sometimes it's just the little nuanced things that you see during the trading week. Sometimes it's uh, the bad advice that you're getting from some con artist. I'll happily dispel it or I'll tell you if it's legit. But just keep in mind, I don't like calling out specific names just because it's not my character. Um, you know, my integrity is more important than talking about specific thieves right so i don't want to lower myself to that but I'll, I'll explain i'll explain the methodology and help you understand that better um so any questions that you have like i said i'm an open book on to next week i'm really excited i hope this was informative to everybody thank you very much happy 2022 have a great rest of your day everyone we'll talk to you soon